Okay, let's pray. Um, Lord, thank you so much, Lord, that we get to get together and uh, hear your word and just be instructed by you. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would uh, continue to allow us, strengthen us, give us the grace that we need uh, to apply these things, Lord, to our lives. So truly, Lord, you would be able to change us uh, and that we would allow you, Father, that you uh, would, would just continue to be Lord of our lives, the Savior of our, our lives, and continue to um, really just just dramatically, Lord, impact our lives through your word as we're teaching and, and uh, just going through the teaching of what your word says, Lord, and how Paul uh, taught the Church of Colossae. Uh, we pray that we would benefit off of it as well uh, by uh, applying these things, Father, and really yeah, all to glorify you, Lord, all to allow you uh, to look at us and to see yourself, Father, to see us as righteous, Lord, to see us as uh, clean. So help us to uh, like Paul is saying here, put on that new garment, Lord, mm. in a sense. And uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So Colossians um, chapter 3. You guys remember last time we were talking about practical issues? And does everybody have notes, by the way? You guys all got the... Okay. Um, but we talked about, hey, if you truly believe what we've been teaching oh. about in Colossians, there's going to be a change, right? There's going to be a change in our lives. And, and, and we looked at our position in Christ, we looked at our practice in life. Paul talked a lot about putting off a bunch of stuff. You guys remember all that stuff last week we talked about? And now he's going to talk about putting on a whole, uh, putting on things. So last week he talked about putting off a lot of these negative things. This week is, made, well, a lot of positive stuff we're going to see it put on these things. So let's just dive in and, and see what he's talking about here. It says in verse 12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, in verse 13 of Colossians 3, uh, and forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, Put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So, notice this word, going back to verse 12, notice this word uh, that Paul's been talking about, all the way from verse 1, putting off, right? And then putting on. It's in reference in the same context from verse 1 all the way to 17 about putting on and off clothing, garments, if you will, carries that idea. So, to put off means put off that the old, dirty, rotten, stinky, old man, right? Mm -hmm. The flesh. And to put it on is talking about putting on the clean, the new, the new man, right? That we are in Christ Jesus. So that, that's the context that Paul's dealing with. So we looked at several things last week that we are to put off, right? Fornication, uncleanness, evil desires, covetousness, anger, wrath, uh, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Remember all those things that Paul talked about? And that's all the negative stuff that we're to put off. And now he's going to jump into that, those positive things. So what, what, what's, what is this new garment that you and I are, are to put on, this, this new life, right? I think about what Paul told Rome. You guys remember Romans? It's in verse, chapter 13, verse 14. He says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, to fulfill its lust. Speaking, you guys see the, the same context that Paul's talking about here in Colossians is the same thing that he's talking about there in Romans. Hey, as we put on the Lord Jesus, in essence, we're, we're really putting on that new garment, right? That new man, because we are new creations in Christ Jesus, right? We are a new creation. So there's really three things that I broke up this study in today. Three ways that we can look at 
these garments, three different angles, I guess you can say, in looking at these garments and how we were put on these garments. The first is really the reason for the new garment. The reason for the new garment. Look at verse 12. It says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Let's just stop there. So what is the reason that we put on this new garment? It's a good question, mm. right? Uh, and I want to give you guys three reasons really that are outlined. Paul actually outlines for us here in verse 12 in answering this question, what is, what is the reason that we're to put this on, right? We're not questioning his position. We understand that Paul, right, he hears from the Lord. We understand his position in Christ. But the first reason that he gives us as far as putting on these new garments is because, number one, we are elect. Because we are the elect. And this word elect, and I got that in your notes too, the Greek meanings and everything, uh, eklektos, right? Like that, eklektos. Uh, it means select. It means chosen, okay? So you and I are chosen. You and I are elected by God. We, oh, in other words, we've been predestined by God, right? Romans 8, uh, verse 29 talks about it. This whole idea of predestination, election, uh, you know, that we've been chosen by God deals with really the foreknowledge of God. Okay? And that's where I get that from, is Romans chapter 8, verse 29. And Paul says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So you and I have been chosen by God, and really it has nothing to do with you and I at all. It really doesn't. It, okay, I understand there's free will. We'll get to that. But Jesus said in John 15, 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Now, Ephesians 1, 4 says, Just as he chose us in him, when? Before the foundation of the world. Notice that, that we should be <laughs> holy, and that's what Colossians is talking about right there in verse 12. And, and without blame before him in love. But so it had nothing to do with our performance, that God chose us, that God elected us, that God predestined us, if you will. But it was based on his foreknowledge, right? You, you might say, wow, so we're the elect, we're the chosen. That's pretty amazing, right? Yes, we are if you are a believer in Christ. So where, where does your free will come into play then, right? Are, are you really chosen? Um, the Bible clearly teaches the sovereignty of God, but the Bible also clearly teaches the free will of man, that we have a choice in the matter. So uh, Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, hello, uh, it says, uh, well, it says, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. So obviously that was a choice back then in the Bible, right? There was a choice in the matter. In Romans 10, 13, for, oh, here comes the word, whoever, notice that, that means only the elect. Oh, eh. That means whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, for the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Oh, did he really mean all there? I mean, don't really take the Bible for what it says, right? I mean, come on, you can't really take every word. Yes, you can. Because the Bible also says in John 3, 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. A lot of people would take that word world and they would slash it out and they'll put, no, 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 it was only through the elect that he came to save, right? For God mm -hmm. so loved the elect <laughs> only. Yeah. That means only a little select few, right? No, uh -uh, wrong. It, God came for all the world, right? That all the world would be saved. So what is God's heart? That all the world would be saved, okay? So clearly we are chosen, but clearly 
we have a choice in the matter. So obviously there's an invitation that's open to everyone. There's not only a select few that this invitation is open for. And you might say, okay, so wait a minute. How do I know that I'm chosen then? Because there, that's another question. Make the choice to be chosen, okay? You, you can choose to be chosen. Yeah, wait a minute. I could choose to be chosen. Now, if you choose to be chosen, then you know that you are chosen and that you made the right choice, if in that sense. Kind of make sense? So you might say, okay, how do I know that if I am chosen, right? Then choose not to choose. If you really want to know that you're not chosen, you choose not to choose. You have a choice in the matter. So if you have not chosen to be chosen, then now you have made the choice to be chosen. I had to write that down. <laughs> so if you're choosing not to be chosen, right? You guys kind of with me there? Mm -hmm. So you can choose not to follow Christ in layman's term, right? For simple terms, right? There you go. So I don't want to serve the Lord. I don't want to be born again. I don't want to choose Christ. Then you just chose not to serve the Lord, not to be chosen by God. So were you chosen by God in the end? Were you part of the elect in the end? Well, you chose not to be a part of that. So it's really, really, really simple to look at. But if you keep looking into it, you look at what man's thoughts are, you're going to get super confused. And you're going to get all, blah. But if you just look at what the Bible says, man, it's like, <coughs> it's like laying butter on bread, right? You're like, Nothing too complicated about mm -hmm. that. So clearly we have a choice. So the point is, we, we can put on these new garments. Why? Because we have been chosen. So it has been based solely on the foreknowledge of Jesus Christ, right? The election and also the free will of us. We had a choice in the matter. So let's come to the second reason that we are chosen. The second reason that you and I are chosen is because you are holy. Look at verse 12 again, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy, notice that word holy. Um, and that's where we get our English word saints, by the way. It means set apart, means separate, right? So all of us here, if we have faith in Jesus Christ, if he's our Lord and Savior, if we have saving faith, right, by the grace of God, um, we are called saints, Okay, and we, we have, a, a, it's not that we have arrived to some kind of status, you know, right. hood, whatever, sainthood. People are not going to pray to you and worship <laughs> you, right? You're not dead. <laughs> We're alive, and you're still called a saint. But all it means is that you are set apart for Christ. It's simply what it means, right? People complicate things. Mm. But you're, you're separate from who you used to be, right? You're separated from the flesh. You are now a new creation in Christ Jesus. You put off the old. You're putting on the new man, if you will. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17, he says, Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Touching the unclean is going back to the old self, right? The old ways, the old habits. And, and that is the one reason that we can put these new garments on is because we are set apart, because we are holy, right? We're saints. Not practically now, right? <laughs> right now, you guys, and uh, we're sinners, right? We're, we fall short of God's glory. We make mistakes. But uh, we are holy positionally. When God yeah. looks at you and I, he sees himself there on the cross. He sees his bloodshed that is covering your sins, which has now made you as white as snow, right? Your sin that was disgusting and red as crimson and just bleh, right? You are now beautiful in the eyes of God because God sees you not the way you are now, but the way you are positionally in Him. It's not some kind of thing like God is deceived in some way. He knew what He was doing before the foundation of the world. He knew that He was going to come and die on the cross before He even made man. So it's not like God's, you know, there's some kind of deception thing going on. God, we're in heaven because he thinks we're holy, right? <laughs> Woo, we got him tricked. It's nothing like that, right? He knows what he's doing, and he knows who you are. And that's the whole point of him dying on the cross. It doesn't make sense if he didn't die on the cross, right? You'd be like, oh, confused. Um, so let's come to the second reason we are chosen. Um, not, not only because you're holy, the third reason, I'm sorry, the third reason is... Uh, that we put on this new garment in Christ. What's the reason that we put on this new garment? Why is Paul even telling us these things? 
is because what we are loved. Look at verse 12 again. It says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, right? We are loved. The word love there is the agape, right? And, and it means having been loved. You have been loved. And it's from the foundation of the world that you and I have been loved before we were born. God's love for us is not based on performance. It's not based on, oh, I have a GED, whatever it is, your career maybe, right? And that's why God chose me and elected me because I'm, you know, I go to church and do everything I possibly can in church and I've made some kind of thing for myself in the eyes of God. No, right? It's not the, not, not the case at all. You're loved uh, because of Christ, because of what he did, because of his character and who he actually is. In fact, Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So notice that God loved us in spite of us, Amen. right? So, and, and, and he's giving us his great love to us. Why is he giving his love to us, right? So that we, in turn, would show the exact same love to others. So he's being our example of how to follow and how to be and how to do, basically. So this new garment we put on is all based on Jesus Christ and his finished work there upon the cross. Not upon you, right? Okay? You guys with me on that? Mm -hmm. It was yeah. Okay, all right. So he picked us, he set us apart. Um, our uh, Calvinist friends, <laughs> they'll argue with this, right? They'll be like, wait a minute. You shouldn't give the gospel to people. Well, I wouldn't say all of our Calvinist friends. There's some who actually, if you actually know that they stand for their doctrine, it doesn't make sense to give the gospel, right? In other words, I, t I told somebody, hey, God loves you so much. And I had a Calvinist person, they're like, oh, don't tell them that God loves them. You don't know that God loves them. I was like, what? <laughs> uh, excuse me? Yes, I do. The Bible is very, very clear that God loves the whole world. Right? That's when you actually look at scripture for what it says. But, um, oh, a quick side note for you guys. William Carey, right? One of our uh, missionaries uh, of the past. He, he told his church, hey, uh, I'm just feeling called to go to, you know, the, that region of India and, and give the gospel to them. And they, they just struck him down. They are like, if God wants to save them, then he will do it himself. Right? They were huge then. So William Carey... Obviously, you guys can read up on him. He, he ended up going still. God still provided it that way. And now we call him basically the father of modern mission, right? Modern missionaries, basically. He's one of the, the ones who made such an impact. There's all kinds of orphanages, churches, a bunch of foundations, organizations, whatever, all because William Carey was able to carry <laughs> the gospel of Jesus Christ, <laughs> right, to uh, India. Now India has been impacted like crazy with the gospel. That It just spread like crazy. So this whole idea of... It's like a cancer, right? When you listen to man and man's ways, man's teachings, by the way, if you're listening to every word that I say as true, then you're not true because you need to listen to the word of God. You are called just as much as I am called to study the word of God yourself. And if you're Amen. coming in and you're not studying the word of God and you're just taking man's word, how different is that of you from being in a Mormon church, a Jehovah's Witness church, another church, right? You need to study the word of God and see if these things are true. I don't care if I'm... Paul the Apostles is standing before you guys, right, in the flesh. And he's teaching you guys these things. I don't care how much God has impacted his life. The Bereans still, knowing all that, they still took it to Scripture and still looked at these things. And that's what we're called to do as well. So uh, stay away from these. I, I would encourage you to stay away from commentaries. Just stick to the pure Word of God, right, and just study the, what the Word actually says. God is actually able, believe it or not, to teach you these things. Isn't that mm. cool? So, and then you can later on, whatever. But let's come to the second thing. Our responsibility to the new garment. Our responsibility to the new garment. Look at verse 12. Again, it says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. This word tender mercies means basically having held back, which I do deserve. Now, you guys know judgment is what we do deserve, right? We deserve hellfire, brimstone, war never dies, fire, right? Ah, ah, ah. When you're there, you're not like, I don't deserve this. No, you're you're like, I deserve this. I deserve more than this, right? But, okay, so that's judgment. Grace is, grace is getting what you do not deserve, okay? 
Grace is getting what we do not deserve. Mercy is getting basically holding back what we do deserve. So we do deserve God's punishment, condemnation, that separation from God for all eternity. Why? Because the moment that we came into this world, you and I were sinners, right? In need of a Savior. We were in need of the salvation of the gospel. And, and God held back what we deserve because we put our faith in Christ Jesus, right? In his death and his resurrection for you and I. So when you and I put on these new, these clean garments, if you will, our response is going to be mercy. Isn't that cool? Toward yeah. others. We have the tendency to judge others based on what, you know, we think or what, you know, we, I don't know, what they say, what they do, right? Uh, but but they, don't, they don't measure up to us. They don't, you know, our standards. They're, they're not doing what we think that they should be doing. And, and, and you know, they're, so somehow we become judgmental, basically. We look down on them and we judge them and we condemn them and we, you know, strike them down, if you will. But Paul says, hey, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. <clears throat> if you put on the old... Or, I'm sorry, if you put off the old and you put on the new garments, what, what's happening? Our response should be mercy toward other people now. Yeah. Okay? So, okay, all right. So, which makes a huge difference. So, with the same mercy that God has given us, that's the same mercy that we should show onto others. So, I realize that we're all different, right? All of us are different. We all have different gifts, different talents, different um, attitudes, different character traits, and whatnot. But the problem is, we begin to look at other people as uh, that are different than us. They're not the same way like we are. And we begin to condemn them. We begin to judge them because they don't do what you do because you are righteous all of a sudden. <laughs> No, not, not all, but, well, not us, right? Obviously other churches do that, <laughs> not our church. Anyways, the second response, it's kindness, okay? There's the second response, kindness, which basically means gentleness, okay? Now, it's the opposite of being harsh, being aggressive, being abusive. That's basically the opposite of gentleness. Paul said in Ephesians 4.23, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So admit it, all of us have had those bad days. Whether it's like once a year, once a month, or every day, I don't know. Or you're just grumpy, and you don't want to talk to anybody, and you're just harsh to others, and you could care less about you know, how they feel. And you're just like, oh, you know? But Paul says, when you put on the new man, there's going to be a gentleness about us. And guess what's going to happen if that gentleness... Well, it's a sacrifice, first of all, isn't it? Because you don't feel like being, you know, kind. You don't feel like being gentle towards others. You, you just... You don't... Uh, but you sacrifice to, do, to be gentle towards them. And what is that? That is called worship. It's worship when you have to basically be set apart, right? You choose to sacrifice your wants and your needs for the sake of others. And Paul says, when you put on that new man, hey, you're putting on that gentleness, right? People are going to love to be around you, by the way, if you're practicing these things. So if you're not, write those things down in your hand, whatever you got to do. That's a prayer request. Say, hey, I got to work on this area of my life. I got to be gentle towards others. I can't, you know, be a, a novelos in front of them. <laughs> I got I to gotta be a, a Christian. So now for some of us, some of you guys, the Lord did that, boom. The moment you guys give your life to the Lord, other people, God's been working in that area for years <laughs> and years. And it's just, it's a work, and I understand that. So there's the third response, and it is humility, okay? Our response, as far as putting on that new garment uh, that, of the Lord, putting on the Lord Jesus, now our response should be, what? Humility, I love this word. Now, it basically means lowly. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Now, lowliness of mind or humbleness of mind means putting the needs of other people above your needs, right? Being proudful of mind or prideful of mind, however you say that word, uh, means putting ourselves above the needs of others. Oh, you need help moving? Oh, I'm sorry, I scheduled myself in to go to the grocery store, <laughs> right? You're, all of a sudden, it's about you if you have that prideful mindset. But if you have that humbleness about you, where you humble yourself, all of a sudden, it's all about the needs of others. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Look at verse 3. Philippians 2, 3 
It says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than it now. You guys are probably thinking, okay, I hate being a Christian now. Right? <laughs> you read this, you know, really, I did not sign up for this. Let others be basically better than you. Let others, or I'm sorry, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interest of others. So obviously you're looking out for your own interests, but you're still placing the others, uh, other people above your own, right? Mm -hmm. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, Paul says. So apart from the humility, guess what? We cannot receive grace. Now, I know I just threw that out there like it was just nothing, but really, I, I want you guys, if you actually study the Bible for yourself, there is so much, you're going to be blessed. So, what is God's grace access? So, if I have God's grace, what will it include with it, right? What's attached to God's grace if God's grace is in my life? You're going to see literally a whole bunch of things, like a, a whole bunch of things that are a blessing to you. Now, I'll give you guys just a quick little, quick little thing, but... 1 Peter 5.5, 5, in fact, James 4.6, uh, says, well, basically, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to who? The humble. The humble. So without this humbleness of heart, without this humbleness of mind, we cannot receive God's grace. Now, God's grace, look at it like this, a key, right? God's, well, a hum humility, right? Look at humility like a key, right? Which, this key can access, unlock, if you will, God's grace in our lives. You want to be a part of everything that God has for you? Then the only way to access that is through humility. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. So we need God's grace for a whole bunch of things, right? But there's really two things uh, I'm just going to narrow down and just give you guys. And like I said, it's your homework. You guys can study it on your own. You'll be super blessed. I know I was in my own life. Um, but really, the first thing that I notice is for salvation. We need God's grace for salvation. That's kind of the starting point, isn't it? Um, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved, there's salvation, through faith. And that not of yourselves, not of your own performance, right? It is the gift. It's a gift of God. You can't earn it by it, right? Any of that. It, not of works, lest anyone should boast, right? So it's not about you, it's about Jesus. So when we humble ourselves... What happens? We realize that we cannot save ourselves, that we needed Jesus Christ in our lives. We turned to the Lord. He in, then, in turn, gave us His grace, right, for salvation. But, but that's just the starting point, right? What's the second main thing that we need God's grace for? We need His grace, basically, for every moment of every day of our entire lives, right? I don't know how to put that in one word. We need it for everything. Right? So we oftentimes, we, we have this idea, okay, I've given my life to Jesus, I was saved by faith through grace, um, because of what Jesus did by, in my life, and now somehow we think it's up to us, all of a sudden. Yeah. Right? That somehow our Christian life, our Christian walk, is now based on our performance. Okay, so now I'm going to go to church and I'm going to get involved in every single area that I can. Who needs, oh, we need help doing it, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. hey, me, look at me. Right? All of a sudden, you're going to do as much as you can in the church. And then all of a sudden, you're the only one who gives the most in the church. And, and when it's time to worship, you're the loudest in the church. Right? When it comes to prayer, you're the most words. And, you know, as if that did it doesn't do anything, though. You guys get what I'm saying? As far as your salvation goes, you're still looked at in the eyes of God the same as the other believers next to you. They're studying the Word of God just as much as you. Right? They're a student of the Word of God just like you're a student of the Word of God. There's no, like, right, all of a sudden you're above everybody else because of your doings. I think not, right? We are the same. So that's humility, right? Looking at it in that perspective is good. And actually, it's really good if, if you really look at it. You're going to be blessed every day, um, like, like right now, right? When people tell me, hey, I can't come to church, I don't have the attitude of, like, oh, you can't rah, 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 rah. why because it's not about going to church attendance that's going to make you anything right like you're just you're blessed sure but you're just as is god able to teach them just as much mm. yeah he is right to get in the word so praise the lord for that so 
we that's that's the thing right don't look at your performance look at god's grace and only his grace is able to keep us, hold us right the truth is getting every day and every moment of our lives saturated by god's grace in fact i'll give you guys a quick little i got them right here too a few of them uh, I told you guys there's a whole bunch in the Bible. If you guys just look up God's grace, you're going to be like, whoa, he wasn't kidding. There's literally thousands. Uh, but here's a few. Acts chapter 20, verse 32, we're told that his grace builds us up. In Romans chapter 1, verse 5, we're told that we are obedient to God. Okay, apart from God's grace, you are not able to even be obedient to God. Romans chapter 5. Verse 2, we're told that we can actually stand by God's grace. You can't stand apart from God's grace. Amen. 2 Corinthians, amen. Uh, 4.15, we can give thanks to God by God's grace. Apart from God's grace, you're unable to even give true thanks. On, you don't know what thanks is, right? Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, we can actually serve God by God's grace. Apart from God's grace, you cannot actually serve God. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, uh, we can actually live godly because of God's grace. See, apart from God's grace, you, you don't even know God. So how can you live according to the standard of God? Perfection. You can't perform in your own flesh what is pleasing to God. It's impossible. All right? So the only way we can live life basically onto the Lord is by his grace and that is accessed by humility right you guys with me on here how do you access this grace by humbling yourself man you fall on your face right on your knees before God <coughs> like you would do to a king right and, and what is the picture of you doing that it's giving honor to the other right showing the other that the other is an authority above you right you're giving it submission Mm -hmm. onto the higher those in higher standing ranking than you are that's why we when we call god the lord that's what we're saying when we say the lord right he's the lord of hosts the bible says what is that of all the millions i assume of angels and you know in in heaven that are at one word they're able, they're gonna they'll they'll do whatever he says right and then you look at all these you know these creatures of god that god's created and that he, that he's the Lord of all those hosts, right, of heaven. It's amazing to me. Yeah. So you guys get the, 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 what I'm saying? There's a whole bunch. I can keep going. There's amazing amounts of God's grace. But the point is humility. You cannot have any of these things apart from humility. So let's come to the fourth thing. Whew. There's eight of them. <laughs> the fourth response, meekness. Okay, meekness means basically mild it often it's often been said i know james when he was teaching was talking about it you know it, that meekness is not weakness right and, and meekness is strength constrained basically so it's being strong but having that ability to restrain yourself exercising it basically right mm -hmm. and it carries the idea of not extracting revenge right revenge is the opposite of meekness in the Greek language, I should say. So to be meek means not to get revenge on somebody else, right? So this is the problem for a lot of us, right? So when someone hits your car and they take off, right? You're like, Rah! I remember driving with somebody who's like been a Christian longer than I've been alive. And, and all of a sudden, uh, their car didn't get hit, but somebody kind of like just got cut in, you know, in front of them. And they were like, raw, raw, hunking at them. And I was all, oh. <laughs> you're not practicing meekness, buddy. <laughs> you know, like, man. Uh, but, you know, that's the same thing. Well, when somebody cheats you or somebody, you guys get the point, right? You're not, you're not going to do this. You're not going to be like, oh, oh, Lord, I just pray you bless that person. God, that you would just, you don't do that. Come on. All right? That's the problem with us. We don't, we're not willing to just practice this meekness in our hearts. So everyone wonder why the Bible says, hey, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Because if you come to me and you punch out one of my teeth, I'm going to go to you. I'm going to punch out all of your teeth. <laughs> God, God's really saying, hey, be, give, give, they took one, you take one. But the thing is, when we want revenge, we go beyond the point, mm. right, of what they've done onto us. And, and so that's the Old Testament. But God knows, hey, 
It, it, it's amazing. So one for one, basically, right? So meekness is putting on that ability to not extract revenge uh, on, on other people, basically. Not get that, don't have ability, don't strike them back, basically. Just hold back. You can, right? You could do it, but don't do it. Don't do it. So the fifth response, long-suffering. Look at verse 12 again. Go back to Colossians. <clears throat> Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. There's number one, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Notice this. Uh, basically means patient, okay? So mm -hmm. it carries the idea of taking a very long time for like a pot of water to boil. If I have a lighter and I got this huge pot like this big of water, it's, I'm like, this is taking forever, right? Oh, and that whole time until it boils, that's what's called patience. But this word patience or long-suffering is used in the, in the context of other people, okay? Mm. So this, uh, so we are, we're to be patient as it pertains to other people. So some people know how to make us very boiled up, right? Like, oh, <laughs> my wife doesn't know how to do that yet. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. <laughs> But, like, my mom, my brothers, they know those, like, they lived with me all my life. So they know, they know exactly how to get in there faster than anybody else. And they know how to, like, where I'm just like, Bruh! but you shouldn't do that. That's not practicing long suffering now, right? So, but, so the old man has been put off, the new man has been put on, right? So remember, all of these are responses are, are the responses of Christ in us, okay? That's the hope of glory. Without Christ in our hearts, guess what? You and I are unable to even respond in any of these ways that we just said right here. So our response is always going to be opposite. If we don't have the grace of God, if we're not humbling ourselves, and I understand, okay, that sometimes you guys get in the flesh. I understand that. Um, but that's not showing long-suffering toward others. Yes, you do. <laughs> okay. Let's look at the sixth response. Bearing with one another. Look at verse 13. It says, bearing with one another. That word bearing means basically to hold back, right? So mm. to hold up. It, it's closely related to long-suffering and, and, uh, and mercy. But as God holds back his vengeance or his judgment <coughs> on us, so too we need to do unto others. Hey, we need to bear with others. We need to put up with others. We need to realize that you're just the same as others. You mess up just the same as they mess up. Now, I understand other people are evident, basically, right? Or it's just obvious that they're just, you know. But maybe you're not as evident as they are or as vocal or whatever it is. But when you approach people like this, you know, in that humble state of mind, right? With that humble heart you're going to realize that you are just as guilty as they are, and that's going to change up everything. Now you're going to be able to easily bear it with one another, right? Have you guys ever been on, like, Facebook, and you're like, why are they still a friend? Or why do they have to work here? Or can't we just kick them out of the church? Or, you know, <laughs> no, bear with one another. There's something good in that. Uh, now let's come to the seventh response. Look at verse 13 again. It says, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. That's the, the seventh response here. Forgiving to pardon, to rescue, right? This is not an optional thing. It's a command, by the way, in the Greek, okay? So Jesus Christ, he forgave us unconditionally. There was no conditions about his forgiveness. He forgave us based on the finished work of Christ on the cross. With his bloodshed for you and I, you and I are now made righteous. You and, I, you and I are now made pure in his eyes, right? Because of what he did for us. So notice it says in verse 13, And if anyone has a complaint against another, notice this word complaint, by the way. It means to find fault. That's what the word means. So if you find fault in another person, guess what? You're commanded right here to forgive them. Okay? Christ found fault in us. And he forgave us, didn't he? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So you might ask, wait, 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 Josh. Okay, so how many times should I forgive them? Does this sound familiar? Mm. Seven times? No. Seven, seven. Yeah, seven times. Seventy. Seven. How about that? Okay, 490 times. No, right? Just repetitively, continuously, all the time forgive. That's the, the purpose here. Endlessly forgive them. Always forgive them. Why? Because God, man, he, if he looks at you, 
I'm pretty sure he can find fault in us. Oh, yeah. He? yeah. Yeah, he forgave us. So when we find faults in others, we need to forgive them. Hey, on a social level. So even if they don't ask for forgiveness, you still are called to forgive them. But they didn't ask, so I'm not going to go. I understand, obviously, Matthew 18, you know, there's certain things that we are to do in forgiving others, and there's a, there's a way to do that. Um, and if we forgive others, then, you know, the problem now is no longer on our end now, is it? Now you are free, because you're going to be required of every word that you said, and every action, everything that you've done, you're going to be required at the end of your life, right? So why, why hold this, right, against <coughs> others? Just be free of the burden and mm -hmm. forgive them. But they, they already passed away, so I can't go to them and ask for forgiveness. Yes, you still can in your heart. Did you guys know people still have things against people that are not even alive? Is that crazy? But, oh, but they they live so far away, I can't, or did, I don't even know where they are. How can I forgive them in your heart, right? Then now you're done with that. So then, you know, <coughs> if you don't forgive them, what's going to happen? All of a sudden your heart's going to be turning rotten and moldy and nasty and stinky. And now you're just going to be filled with this bitterness that's just going to spring up in your life. And then all of a sudden, you're going to be angry. You're going to be upset all the time. Your lips are going to be all wrinkled up, and your nose, you're right? Hey, how you doing? Arr, arr. <laughs> you're Let's get you and put you 10 years ago and forgive them right now. Right? <laughs> Man, you turned into a beast, right? So then all of a sudden, your life is full of turmoil, distress. You're depressed. You're eating chocolate and ice cream all day, right? <laughs> so, what, but when you forgive somebody, in person or in your heart, what happens? All of a sudden there's this peace that just, you can't explain it. It just pours over you. That burden that you felt, you can literally feel it physically. That stress is gone, right? All of that depression, that like, you know, that heartache, all your muscles all of a sudden, they loosen up and you're like, oh, <laughs> right? You feel free because you're free in Christ. So do that, amen. You should do it, it's a good thing to do. So just love. So what, what we need to realize though is, and here's a good, on, as we're on this note, is when others sin, it's against God that they're sinning. It's not against you, although you may be impacted by it, but it's not against us. It's against God alone. First John chapter 3, verse 4 uh, it tells me that, hey, transgression is against the law. And who wrote the law? God wrote the law. So therefore, when you sin, it's against God. It's not against man, right? So uh, all sin is against God. David understood this. Psalm 51, verse 4, he says, Against you and you alone have I sinned. You guys remember he, he sinned with Bathsheba. It impacted Uriah's life. Literally, he died from this key, David's sin. Joseph understood this. You guys remember uh, he says, uh, How can I do this sin and sin against God? Right? It wasn't against anybody else, it was against God. So when we realize that all sin is against God, we have a whole different attitude now upon that person, don't we? Now all of a sudden, you're able to forgive them. Now all of a sudden, your heart is going to be broken for them because they are breaking the heart of God. And everything that God has done for them, they're on the cross. To them, he did it in vain. They could care less, and they, they're the ones who are spitting, mocking, beating our Lord Jesus Christ, right? And now you're able to look at them, and now you're broken more so. Now you could care less what they did to you. Now you're looking more so at what they did to God, and that changes everything, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. And now you wonder why it's so easy for Jesus to say, you know, to pray for your enemies, bless them, give them a cup of cold water. And people don't understand. They just they can't get around in their head because they don't have the Holy Spirit in them to... To, to show them these things. Hey, it's because they're doing it against God, not you. Get yourself out of the way. So eighth response, it's love. Here's the agape. And I won't stay on this. We all understood. We've been through what love is. Remember uh, Galatians 5.22? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Obviously, this the fruit of, the, the, and remember, it's singular, is love. Right? So love is joy. Love is peace. Love is gentleness. Love is long-suffering, faithfulness. Well, just, yeah, so 1 John 4, 7 and 8, obviously we know that God is love. The Bible is very, very clear on that. So uh, Romans chapter 13, verse 14 says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ 
right? So we are to put on love because love is Jesus Christ. We're to put on, wrap God's word around your life in every area of your life because he is love. Notice the word love. It's, 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 that's the bond of perfection, by the way, for us believers. It's what brings us, that's what's the, the commonality of all of us believers in the church is God's love, right? Love binds us together, it matures us, it completes us. Love is based on the finished work of Jesus Christ and Him alone. And everything else changes all of a sudden when you realize this, right? And, and thus, there's the change that Paul's talking about here, about putting off the old, putting on the new. That change is because of Christ and what He's done for us. So let's come to the third thing, and this is really a quick uh, sum, summary of uh, everything, but the results of the new garments. This is the results of the new garments in verses 15 and 7 through 17. Look at verse 15. It says, uh, actually look at verse 14. It says, but above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. So there's really three things that result uh, as far as these new garments, right? There's three results, basically, if you put these, these garments on. The first is really it involves the peace of Christ, the peace of Christ. Look at verse 15 again. It says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Now this word rule, by the way, is where we get that word umpire. Right? It, it speaks of somebody who's ruling or reigning as an official. Basically, and remember the sports remember, uh, back then in Rome, uh, Paul probably saw these sports, and there's the umpires, right? They're the, 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 the ones in charge of all the games that were going on. So that's more of the word here. If God is ruling and reigning over your hearts, there's going to be peace of the peace of Christ in our hearts, in our lives. So we need to allow God to rule and reign in our lives because... That's what brings us basically into that peace of Christ in our lives. So since God is ruling and reigning in our hearts, our actions, our attitudes in every area, you can never have the peace of God, you guys have probably heard this, right? Until you first made peace with God. And, and Jesus Christ is that peace. So how do I make peace with peace? <laughs> it's making peace with Christ. The Bible says, Ephesians 2.14, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So notice this, this peace brings us into a calling of one body, right? So this, this is what unites us. This is what something we all have in common and what brings us together, that, that, that glue, if you will, right, is God's peace. So when there's peace in our hearts, there's naturally going to be uh, praise, really. It's going to come out of our hearts. If you guys ever just had that peace of God, and all of a sudden you're like, blah, it just utters out of your, it just falls out of your mouth, right? Just, I just want to worship the Lord. That's just because of God's peace is just all around you. And you just can't help but to just, hallelujah, right? You're just singing there. I don't want to sing to you guys. But look at verse 15 again at the end. It says, in one body be thankful. And that's where it ha what happens when you have the peace of God. You're thankful. So remember this peace is not based on external circumstances, okay? This is hard for some people to understand. True peace is based on the finished work of Jesus Christ and Him alone. You guys notice that I keep on saying that? It's because every single one of these are based on the finished work of Jesus Christ and Him alone. Right? So... As you and I allow God to take full control and allow, you know, his peace to fill us, guess what's going to happen? You're going to realize that you're walking in his perfect will. And that's the cool thing. So notice it also involves the word of Christ. Look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Notice this word. Uh, the word of Christ, the, the word dwell. Notice it says dwell right there. I mean, the word of Christ dwell in your hearts. It means to live in. So as we put off the old and we put on the new, right, God's word is living in us. 
And that's why we're here today, obviously, to study the Bible, right? We're here not just to get in the Word, but to basically allow the Word to get into us. <laughs> Change us, right? Why? So it will live in us. It will dwell in us abundantly, I should say. So the literal translation, I guess you could say, is that you and I have become rich because of the Word of Christ. Now some of you guys are like, what? Like you'll become rich, cha-ching, buddy. Is that no? <coughs> There's four things that Paul lists right here that we can become rich in. And number one is wisdom, and obviously that's from the word. Number two, it's teaching. So obviously when we teach, it's not based on our feelings. It's not based on you know what we think, but rather what the Bible actually says. So that's why you and I are not to believe or what pastors say, you guys aren't supposed to believe every word I say. You're to go and look at the scripture and find out what it says yourself, right? You're required to study the scriptures. Uh, the third thing is admonishing one another. Obviously, that's warning, warning one another. So if you guys notice that sometimes we'll mention names and we'll say, stay away from these people, don't buy their books, don't listen to their teachings, they're wolves, because... Da, 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 are contrary to what the Bible says right here. Da, 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 da. That's admonishing one another. That's the word, and that's what we're required to do. Now, the fourth is in music. Now, it says psalms. That's obviously uh, speaking of musical instruments. Uh, hymns, speaking of songs that are written to the scriptures. You guys notice there are certain songs, and it's all scripture. I love those ones. And then there's spiritual songs. Now, these are songs... I guess you can say they're inspired by the Holy Spirit based on Scripture, but are not necessarily uh, word for word in Scripture, right? So all of this needs to be done through the grace, obviously, that has been given to us, right? That unmerited favor. So let's look at the, the last thing is really, it involves the name of Christ. Look at verse 17. It says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through <coughs> Him. So the name of Christ, what does the name of Christ mean? Right? Have you ever thought about that? The name of Jesus speaks of the authority of Christ. It speaks of the will of Christ. And when Jesus said in John 14, you guys remember, whatever you ask in my name, that I'll, I'll, I'll do for you, basically, right? Whenever we pray, we pray in the name of Joshua, in the name of the state of Kentucky, in the name of, right? No, in the name of Jesus Christ. What are you saying when you say in the name of Jesus Christ? You're saying everything that entails and describes and who he actually is, the character of, the will of, of who Jesus is. When if I say and blah, 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 in the name of Joshua is everything that Joshua believes, in agreement with what my will is, my wants, my desires. But if I say in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm saying whatever is in the will of Jesus, whatever is the want of Jesus, whatever is the desire of Jesus. Amen. Amen? So, so that's basically what we're saying. So the name of Jesus Christ also speaks of salvation. I'll just end with that. Last verse, uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Obviously, there's a whole bunch more about the name of Jesus, um, and obviously your salvation is the main part about the name of Jesus. There's so much power in his name alone, uh, and we can, we can go on and on and on about that, but I'll let you guys... Like I said, study, study, study. It's a good thing when you do it yourself. Um, so let's go ahead and pray, and let's give it to the Lord. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your word that is able to penetrate our hearts, that brings us to our knees, to tears before your face, Lord. May we uh, just continually, Lord, humble ourselves before you. That we might receive your grace for every single day, for every moment, for every uh, conversation that we have, for everything that happens before us that we don't even plan on happening, Lord. May we receive your grace, your strength, Lord, your favor, even uh, because of uh, who you are. We pray that you, Lord, will just transform us, change us as we put on you. Uh, we pray that you would continue to impact us, continue to show your qualities, continue to shine your light, and may we just uh, allow you to do that work, Father, as we put on and as we choose you uh, help us, keep us from getting caught up in the doctrine of man, in man's laws, in man's ways, uh, but rather keep us 
uh, just uh, safe, Lord, with mm. you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Guys, I so